Okay, so let's look at, uh, in this session, we will look at uh, the next 40 years. Uh, 40 years of, uh, you know, uh, important, uh, you know, writers. Uh, so when we talk about restoration period, restoration is, uh, restoration, uh, very important aspect was restoration theater. Theater's drama, that is the restoration play, right? So we have was restoration comedies, well-known comedies, many well-known comedies, and particularly one important comedy we will look at very in detail, okay, in tomorrow's session, the contribution of that uh, comedian, uh, that is that, that playwright, that is William Congreve, okay. But overall, let's look at the, you know, the characteristics of restoration comedies, uh, in which some of the plays were contributed by John Dryden also, okay. So we will look at John Dryden as a, uh, playwright and uh, poet also separately along with uh, of course John Dryden as a uh, critic also later uh, on criticism topic we will come back to that right so in this period there were a lot of uh, playwright from 1660 to 16, uh, 1700 yeah rough time but it is the time of theatre okay revival of theatre theatres which were closed in 1642. Okay, so we all know that theatres were closed in 1642 after 18 years when Charles II was restored to the kingdom. When he came back from France, all those Commonwealth Puritan interregums rules, like ecclesiastical rules were removed, people were prosecuted, right, and monarchy was restored. Okay, so that's why it is called restoration period. And we already in a political social backdrop, we looked at how Charles again revived and, uh, you know, theater and many other activities and how, you know, in a way, restoration theater reflects the age of the time. And that's the way people were there. People were fed up by 18 years of, you know, Oliver Cromwell's regime. Yeah, the strict Puritan norms and morality. So in this backdrop, let's look at how the restoration theater was and some of the major plays and a short gist of some of these you know minor works also but specifically one of the giants of restoration comedy was william congreve okay but remember william congreve arrives very late okay we are going to talk about from 1660 to 1700 roughly but william came congreve arrived on the scene only the last decade of the century that is 1691 92 up to 1700 Okay, so let's look at the characteristics before we come to the individual writers. Okay, so restoration marked the restoration of theater also and all other hierarchies, right? The playhouse, which had been closed during Puritan age, were left open for new experiment, right? After 18 years, Charles and his courtiers, courtiers loved plays and entertainment, right? I already told you how Charles loved all such entertainment. Uh, right as a play as, as you know and he was in france okay he was in exile in france and he underwent all those you know uh the pains right and more than that he knew what happened to his father okay father and uh, how his father was prosecuted so in a in a sense uh, charles uh, you know was never interested in any kind of you know uh political and other issues to fight over or uh, become controversial or uh, come into, you know, uh, dispute with the parliamentarians, right? Okay, except perhaps we had, uh, you know, like uh, passing of Clarendon Code uh, and Anglo-Dutch War, right? If you, if you analyze, these are the, you know, two events which happened, beginning of its career. And of course, the London, you know, the Great Fire of London and the Great Plague, right? All these happened during this time. Right, but particularly in the first 10 years. So Charles II and his courtier loved the plays and entertainment. And he was, you know, even he was, uh, you know, brought up by watching the such plays in France, right? And French time, French literature of, you know, 1630, 40, 50, it was the golden period for French literature, right? So uh, he was inspired by writing, you know, watching those French dramas, which were popular during that time. So when he came back to, you know, England, he wanted them to write similar kind of dramas, plays with a similar theme. Yeah. He encouraged artistic pursuit 
right? And uh, in that sense, because he wanted more entertainment, you know, these kind of uh, things. And uh, in a way, you could imagine Charles Theatre, you know, weekly, maybe every day he might be sitting in the theatre in the evenings, right? With his uh, girlfriends and mistresses, drinking, dancing. This could have been the common thing, right? And imagine, you know, theatre was like that. Okay, and the people too must have enjoyed. So it's not surprising if you look at the most of the themes of these dramas have that so, so, such so such you know such themes, right? So in that sense, uh, you know, I mean, you know, every age in a way, the political, social, and artistic, particularly political landscape, you know, presents. If you look at Hindi. Right. I told you, you know, even today, the movies which are made, it reflects the age, the political time. Yeah. Look at so many Hindi movies on, you know, many of them were propaganda movies, actually. Right. And how they are suddenly made, they know the regime which suggests, you know, which supports such movies. Right. Why the, the, the so-called people whom they are making movies, they, they you know, they are, you know, they, they were there for so, so long. About them, everyone knows. Right. So in a way, it reflects the time. Yeah, it reflects the political time, you know, political atmosphere. That is the time when you come and, you know, a, you know, you can have a, a good time. So that uh, a political patronage you would get at the time. Since Charles wanted such dramatists to write plays, they wrote such dramas. Yeah. Even Dryden was tempted to write such dramas. Okay. Licenses, dramas, meanings, you know, and we'll see what are the characteristics of drama. So it is the political play a very important role, right? Okay, so in a way, it is equivalent to that of how it happens today, right? These dramas lack the charm, glory, and refinement of Elizabethan theater, right? Most of these dramas, they dealt with licentious themes, themes immoral themes, you know, intrigues, gossip, love affair, multiple love affairs, extramarital affairs, okay, sexual innonoids, yeah? Majority of the theme. For example, take the very famous, you know, play like The Country Wife. In The Country Wife, the hero pretends that he has become eunuch. And he mingles with girls and then seduces them. Right? Uh, this is the broadly the play. And all of you must have read the plays like, you know, The Way of the World. The most iconic, the best drama of the period. Right? There also, the hero, you know, literally loves or, you know, he almost... Uh, flirts with almost four women yeah anyway let's we see that some of the important characteristics as we know candle lights candle lights were already introduced you know during elizabethan time right okay so candle lights were there during this time new things were like floodlights a drop curtain and painted sceneries were introduced during elizabeth you know during the restoration period but the most important innovation was introduction of women actresses okay first time in the theater women were allowed to play the role elizabethan time women were not allowed women's role were performed by uh, young boys okay or girls please remember okay so women actresses and the very famous actress of the time was nell Juen. okay nell Juen was the heartthrob of most young men and her personal vigor and charm right in fact, the major, major reason could have been, you know, she was mistress of Charles II, right? She gave birth to two of her sons, illegitimate sons. Yeah, not just that, even the other actresses of the time were almost like mistresses of Charles too. So maybe that could be the reason that they were allowed to work on theatre, right? We don't know. The long suppressed natural impulse of love and indulgence of the Englishman, you know, which was, you know, which was shut during 18 years, because that is the core nature, right? Human nature of enjoyment and all such kind of pleasure. Now, when these, you know, when theatres were open, now all the rules were broken, they came out of that. So in that sense, the content of the restoration play revealed this natural, you know, collapse of the taste and the values, right? And all the mad values, because in a sense that, People were really fed up by the 18 years of regime and, you know, they would come, they come, came out of that and well welcomed all such things because English people were not like, you know, those conservative ones. Okay, so in a way, 
they wanted all all such thing and the society also reflects that right so something about Nelgwin her full name was Eleanor Nelgwin born in 1650 died in 1687 was a long time mistress of Charles II of England and Scotland she was called pretty well witty Nell by Samuel Pepys in his diary she has been regarded as a living embodiment of the spirit of Restoration England and has came to be considered as a folk heroine with the story echoing the rags to royalty tale of Cinderella, right? How a ordinary girl who came and became a famous actress, yeah? Like a Cinderella story. This was a painting, Nell Jwain. From 1666 to 69, Nell was leading comedian of the King's Company, played continuously, save for a brief absence in 1667. While she was the mistress of Log Burkhurst, Afterwards, sixth Earl of Dorset, right? She created such popular roles in Polymer in John Dryden's Secret Love, Mirinda in James Howard's All Mistaken, and Jacinta in Dryden's Evening's Love, right? These were the other comedies of the time, okay? You don't have to go through in detail, just names, titles, rest of the list is, you know, already with you, remember, if possible, three, four lines, some information about the place, Nell became mistress of Charles II in 1669. Her last step stage appearance was heart in Dryden's conquest of Granada by the Spaniard. Right? This was her last play in 1670. The production of which had been postponed several months for her return to the stage after the birth of her first son by King in 1670. Right? That was the reason why the production was postponed Okay, when she became his mistress. Right? Noel had two sons by King Charles, Charles Balkirk, 1670, and he lived up to 1726, and James Balkirk, who was born in 1671 and died in 1680. Of all the mistresses of Charles II, Nell was the only one beloved by public. She was small, slender, and shapely, and with a heart-shaped face, hazel eyes, and chestnut brown eyes, hair, she was illiterate and scrawled and awkward, e.g. at the bottom of her letters, written for her by her others, right? In this way, she used to put her signature. She never forgot her old friends and as far as she's known, remained faithful to her royal lover from the beginning of their intimacy until his death and after his death to his memory. That is, even after the death of Charles II, okay? And when he died in 1685, okay? When Charles died in February 1685, Nell was so deeply in debt that she was outlawed by her creditors. Yes, she was in so much debt. The king's deathbed request to his brother, that is James II, the king was, let poor Nelly no, let not poor Nelly starve. Yeah. However, he was faithful. It was carried out by James II, who paid off enough of her debts to reestablish her credit and gave her a sizable amount in cash and settled on her a pension of £1,500 a year, right? That is after the death of James, Charles I, Charles II, okay? For the remaining three years, between, you know, 1685 to 1688, okay? Till glorious revolution happened, right? In March 1687, Nell was taken by apolox apolox apoplexy, that is, you know, like epilepsy and partial paralysis she suffered. She died eight months later and was buried in St. Martin's in the field church. Okay. So that's what about her, the way most famous actors of the time. There are, there were th other three, four uh, actresses. Okay. You should know the names there also. They were thoroughly demoralized by the successive political and religious changes. Okay. Of what was happening in restoration period. The unjust law, arbitrary trials, religious prosecution, the Puritan hypocrisy, all these, you know, paved the way for revolution. And when restoration happened, people loved it. Okay. The restoration drama in that sense holds the mirror up to the nature of its society. Because it's not just the drama in a way, not because just Charles encouraged them to write such dramas, but basically people themselves were like that. Okay. After an imagine, you know, you can't eat, uh, you can't... Uh, Allow sex, romance, eating, game, play, everything was banned for 18 years. 24 into 7 prayer. Yeah. Every day morning, b b breakfast prayer, lunch prayer, dinner prayer. You can't eat meat. 
right? No, you can't go for bear hunting, fox hunting, or all those games. Everything was banned, right? From 1642 to 1660, right? 18 years, right? So in that sense, basically, in a way, the people themselves were fed up. And people like that, right? Okay, human nature, whenever you ban something, no, then people will always, you know, come out of that, right? And we don't have to go very far. You can see that, you know, as, you know, during COVID's time, when all our class mark shops were banned, what happened? When it was opened, people stood for one kilometer, two kilometers, right? Okay. And they, it's not a product. Okay. Same thing will happen if tomorrow they ban, you know, tea. Imagine tea is banned in the country and after one month tea is restored, there will be a big line of list, you know. It is nothing to do with the product. Right. Same thing happens with, you know, all these, you know, social media. Look at, you know, 2000, you know, 18 or 19 when TikTok, TikTok issue, all of you must have read, you know, when, when they came to know that TikTok, you know, was about to be banned, etc., you know, more than two crores TikToks were, you know, downloaded from playhouses. Okay. Uh, this is about same. Okay. Everywhere it is same. Yeah. Irrespective of the time, which has nothing to do with the product. Okay. Same thing could happen to anything whenever something is bad. Right. Okay. The early restoration drama depend on the royal patronage. Right. In Vikingless play, Country Wife, the hero secures admission into the privacy of women by pretending to be eunuch and then seduces them. The exploits of a hero and the plot motive of the play seems to have appealed to the audience of the day. Okay, so they also like that. Okay, they also denied all the pleasure, company of women and men, right? They also like that. And King himself was like that. King was encouraging. King himself had multiple, you know, uh, uh, girlfriends. Okay, he says that he had more than 41 children, right? An unlimited number of, you know, uh, mistresses, right? Tragedy was that he never had a, you know, legal heir. You know, he was, his wife, you know, could not give him a legal heir. That's why all the issues started when after his death, when James II became the king, right? Okay. The, this place, this play exploited the hero and plot motive seem to attract the restoration play goers. The early restoration plays are dumped as mediocre by literary critics. Okay, the earliest one, 1661 to 63, 64, at the time, these plays. But the least restoration drama earned credit by reviving the plays of Shakespeare or even Ben Johnson, right? Like, in, for example, Dryden revived the play of Shakespeare, right? There were others, those who did that. Like, we, as already we know that King Lear was revived and, you know, re-adapted in a modified way. Then uh, Dryden wrote the play Antony and Cleopatra with a diff different title. We'll see to that all. After Vicarly, the low taste in drama went out of fashion until the arrival of William Congreve on the stage and laid the foundation for the revolution, evolution of restoration comedies. Right? It is interesting paradox that, you know, this restoration literature has plays like this, but at the same time, like plays like My Country Wife, uh, but at the same time, plays, you know, works like Paradise Lost or uh, uh, Samuel Pepys' Diary, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress or Dryden's political work like Absalom and Akitopal or even Newton's, you know, scientific work, okay, Mathematica Principia, right? So it's a very kind of a lot of paradox in that sense. Two important events of the time, Great Plague and Great London. Please remember the political backdrop in which it was there. The famous Black Death of the 13th century periodically ravaged the country in the restoration period. It acquired the name of the plague. Okay. The rat bearing plague. Okay. It is similar. Okay. Similar to that of how it happened. Uh, the COVID-19. Yeah. But COVID-19, whether it's naturally happened or, you know, it was created and made issue. Okay. All those are debated even today. Okay, so there's a big, you know, that, okay, that it was deliberately created to create geopolitical havoc. All those narratives are done there and it has done that, okay. It has, it has done that damage also, geopolitical, if you look at, okay. So whether the, the, whether the virus was correct or whether it impacted the number of people died, all those are correct. Maybe more people died. Yeah, yeah. Officials figures it suggests, I think, somewhere 1 crore 40 50 lakh people died throughout the world. It says, right? I think 1 crore, I don't know, 1, 1 crore, 1, 1 or 10 somewhere, right? I'll check, check and tell you. 
But the same way, the India data around six to seven lakh, that is also very underestimated. They, they say that it is, you know, it must be 45 to 50 lakhs. Okay. So in a way, this kind of plague happened throughout the, you know, ages, right? So here, when it happened in 1665, 64, 65, it was known as Black Death. Okay. That is, these flea-bearing rats were cause of the spread of the disease. It perpetually broke out in towns, ports, and riverside where the ship bone flea bearing rats multiplied. The plague destroyed a great portion of population but stuck the imagination more. Right? The rejoicing of London for the accession of James I had been cut short by the outbreak, not by James I, uh, Charles I, Charles II. Okay? So even the celebration which was going on, okay, for a year long celebration. Another catastrophe of the greater in dimension and consequence than the plague was the great, you know, uh, fire of London, okay, the great fire of London of 1665, okay, right, almost it has completely destroyed the London city. Suddenly all the London were ablaze between the tower and the temple. No one could trace the cause of the fire. It remained a mystery. But the fire went on unabated for five days and reduced many mansions and houses ashes okay the old london which was made out of you know uh, you know goods the residential and business quarters the symbol of prosperity and wealth dating from middle ages and consumed by angry tongue of the fire the medieval and tudor city had disappeared in the flame right only the brick houses were spared 89 churches including the saint paul's cathedral had been burned right the completely london was burned and it took around, you know, six, 50 to 65 years to completely restore the, you know, uh, London and built all these churches. And we know that most of these churches were built by the genius, the, uh, you know, the architecture Christopher Wren. Okay. He was the famous architecture who built most of the churches in the next 50 years. Okay, the pride and of English and classical dignity and grandeur of modern London architecture is due to the genius of Christopher Wren, the renowned architecture of the time. The reconstruction of the St. Paul's Cathedral and other building went on at an astonishing pace. It was only complete, completed by 1715, okay, 1715, Queen Anne's period, okay, right? Restoration is also known as the Age of Dryden. Right, because Dryden was the most imposing literary figure of the time, and it concludes with the death of John Dryden in 1700. Okay, so remember the date. Political social historian, we, we, they may conclude that uh, you know with the you know 1688, and then the age of uh, you know uh, what we call Enlightenment age begins. But for the teacher student, the age is because of this, because John Dryden died and he was a giant during his time. Okay. Okay, literary giant. The prevailing tone of the drama and literature was generally elegant, cynical, and witty, right? Satire became the dominant mode. In a such atmosphere, great work of imagination can find no nourishment, right? And it is not surprising that satire became the most typical form of literature. So criticizing, satirizing, ridiculing, lampooning became the trend. This trend will continue for next 100 years, please remember. Okay. It began during Dryden's time, got it? that is criticizing human nature. So in a way, it is an offshoot of Renaissance ideas. In a way, it's like simple understanding, simple layman's language. Renaissance said that human beings have got reason, logic. They got some rights. They got some values. Right? Human beings are different from other animals. They are special. Right? They, are, they got all such characteristics. The next stage was refinement of those human ideas. And criticizing such ideas, at least, you know, hypocritically, at least, those ideas and, you know, behaviors which were, uh, you know, uh, shown on the society. So the next 100 years, or we can say even 200 years, it was a simply criticism, refinement, okay, uh, of all those Renaissance ideas about human nature, right? And when those ideas are not as it is, you know, according to the society's norms, they were criticized, right? They were ridiculed. They were satirized. So satire becomes the norm, okay? Instruction and message became the characteristics of poetry. So the poet's duty was to instruct, give message, teach, okay? 
right? Correct the society. And this continued till Dr. Johnson's time, okay? They all believed that, okay? Human beings. In a way, they took the pedestal, high pedestal, and believed that believed that they were they were the moral bearers. Okay. So same tone you will find in Alexander Pope, same tone you will find in Dr. Johnson, right? Got it? Like read the poems, Dr. Johnson's poem like London, okay, or poems like Vanity of Human Wishes, right? The whole of you know neoclassical literature. Up to 1760, 1770, it was like that. Okay, so we'll see that we are going to look at the novels and even essays of the time. Okay, and uh, you know other other poems of the time. The period from 1660 to 1700 is also known as Restoration or Age of Dryden. Got it? And so in that sense, it was a Dryden's age. But from 1660, there is a gradual change in the tone of the literature as well as the temperament of the writers. With the restoration, we enter a period in which literature is intellectual rather than imaginative or emotional. It became intellectual, moralizing, sermonizing, criticizing, okay? No place for emotions. The new spirit above all, critical and analytical, it is not creative and sympathetic, but it brings rather intellectual rather than poetic imagination into play, right? So there was no imagination. All those, you know, the grand, you know, imagery, Look at metaphysical poets and their sensuousness, okay, and Elizabethan poetry and their, you know, multiple, you know, genre uh, content of their poetry, everything disappeared, right? Okay, even one genre will became popular for the next, or poetry, or what we call genre in a sense, of course, po poetry and uh, the meter, okay, meter or the stanza, what is known, came to be known as heroic couplet, okay? And the merit of the new school are to be found in the intellectual force and actuality, just as it demerit lie in the lack of deep imagination and tendency, and which has to do only with the superficial, you know, manners and, you know, the issues of the time, okay? The more, the you know, normal behavior, okay? Human behavior, vices, right? And all such, you know, uh, characteristics reflected the literature of the time. Right. The French influence, literature and literary tendencies of restoration period were deeply influenced by French moral. The famous French writers of the period who continued to influence French influence were Pascal, Bossu, Corneille, Racine, and Menore. In fact, some of their plays were literally copied, translated, okay, like Menore's plays where they did that. In fact, they wanted, you know, that playwright, literally they copied those dramas and presented, yeah. The, the long list of restoration drama I've given you, you can see that some of them were like that, okay? All the brilliant company which made the reign of Louis XIV, the Elizabethan age of French literature. So all these writers were popular during 1610 to 1650 in France. And that influence can be seen, right? That's why look, look at, you know, when Dryden wrote, you know, the an essay on dramatic poesy around the same time, 1665, one of Dryden's important contribution as a critic, we see all the, you know, all the examples. He compares English with the French literature, okay, French drama, okay? So we can see how he brings all the illusion and imagination, etc., from French literature, because French had a, France, French literature had a great impact on uh, them, right? France was the nearest country, okay? That could be the main reason, yeah? In particularly, the French influence penetrated every, very deep into drama, especially into comedy, with the most copious literary production of during the Restoration period, okay? Right, after public stage performance had been banned for 18 years by the Puritan regime, Right, the reopening of theater of 1660 signaled the renaissance of English drama, right? And the very famous theater of the time. This was the very famous uh, theater in which all thronged to watch drama, right? And what were the characteristics of the drama? These were comedy of manners. Okay, the same, similar to that of comedy of manners, which was initiated by, you know, Ben Johnson, right? Remember that these comedy of manners will again come. So Ben Johnson, remember the time, 1600, 1605, 1610, 1620. After the gap of 150, 70 years, during 1660, 70, 80, again they will appear. Got it. 
then they will disappear for another 40 50 years then again the comedy of manners will appear right i think ma'am has already done topic for you like uh, you know a sheridan's play there are plays like Rav rivals she stoops to conquer school uh, for scandal anti-sentimental comedy right okay again these dramas will appear after 110 years during the end of 19th century in the plays of Oscar Wilde, okay, like you know, plays like uh, Importance of Being Earnest and other, right? Remember that all these plays have a similar one, but the purpose, tone, okay, and uh, you know, the nature of presentation and attitude differs, right? How they differ, we'll see to that, right? If you take, for example, play like Ben Johnson's Comedy of Manners or take, for example, Restoration play, Way of the World, She Stoops to Conquer, and the name play I named, uh, uh, you know, even uh, plays like, uh, you know, Importance of Being Earnest, right? A lot of similarity you will find, okay? But at the same time, the tone is different, right? Because Restoration Comedy had a different tone, Anti-sentimental comedies of Sheridan and Dryden, uh, Sheridan and Goldsmith, they had a different tone. The purpose was different. In the same way, when after we come, uh, go back after 100 years, when we go to importance of being earnest, there's not much difference between importance of being earnest and, you know, a way of the world, right? You will find a lot of similarity, right? Multiple heroines, multiple intrigue, double character, pretending to love, all those are common things. But the purpose and tone would be different. Okay, remember that. So, what are the characteristics of comedy of manners of you know this uh, restoration comedy? See, most of these scenes are you know uh, happens you know it's a gathering place for the upper classes. Okay, so the characteristics they meet in you know upper classes house, pubs, coffee houses, right, and the very famous parks of London, right, like Saint James Park, right, chocolate houses. These were the places, okay? This is the beginning of, you know, restoration comedy. And at the time, they say between 1700, okay, to 1750, there were 3,000 coffee houses where in London where people can go, meet, discuss, you know, write poetry, talk about drama, etc., etc., right? Most of these, you know, neoclassical writers, Alexander Pope, Jonathan Swift, Dr. Johnson, they used to meet in such clubs. And drink coffee or chocolate. Yeah, chocolate houses were there and write poetry, drama, etc. Right. And here also, this is the place for upper class people to hang over. Yeah, it is equal and dog. You can see, you know, today also we have clubs, we have coffee houses, we have Starbucks, we have CCDs, we have, you know, so many malls, all that, right? Okay. You can imagine the similar way at the time. They were stock characters in restoration comedies, right? We have fops, country pumpkins, elegant young ladies, country pumpkins like buffoons, and older person attempting to recapture their youth and such com you know, common characters, those who want to, you know, have their life. These are common characters across these dramas we will see. The common theme was romantic intrigue, right? Most of the restoration comedies, romantic intrigues, Multiple love affairs, extramarital love affairs, hero pretending to be girl, right? Girl pretending to love two or three men, all such kind of, you know, uh, themes you will find in restoration comedy. Gossip, one of the important characteristics, gossip, right? People used to meet here, coffee houses, chocolate houses, right? They used to gossip a lot about other social and private life. Schemers hatching, plotting against the enemies, right? Everyone plotting to destroy, okay, or to create problem for the other people, right? And most of, imagine who were the characteristics of these, all dealt with upper class and, you know, well, you know, very upper class people, right? Invariably not laymen, right? Laymen may not have time for all that. So these communities dealt with such class, class of people, and their whole duty was they have enough money, they would go and sit and talk about spend time in these parks, roam about, right? And uh, eat and, you know, discuss such issues in coffee, house, coffee houses and chocolate houses. And this is the way they spend their life, okay? 
and it talks about in a way the upper class people and such kind of people are even there in every society even today you will find okay yeah eavesdropping eavesdropping means you know when you listen to someone right who is speaking in nearby table listening overhearing got it okay doing something and listening to what the next person is saying about something okay that's called eavesdropping right eavesdropping is a common characteristic in many of this drama scandals or threat of scandal right multiple love affairs scandals sexual affairs right for example look at the hero of hero of the way of the world right yeah he has relationship with three to four women right okay and you know and this is the way the heroes were this is the way the people were okay it was quite common right it wasn't considered something uh, you know that uh, it wasn't considered something that you know not uh, not happening right it was happening in the society and that is what it reflects and the conversations were witty conversation but it was mostly contrived and artificial right restoration comedy is notorious for its sexual you know explicitness equality encouraged by charles personally and by the rakish aristocratic ethos of his court okay why such dramas were written charles himself encouraged such dramas okay right so when he came back this kind of dramas he wanted because this kind of a dramas he was exposed to in france and he wanted them to write such dramas right and he himself used to come and sit watch drink dance imagine such a you know uh, scenario right and that's why every dramatist you know started writing it and people them this were like that people also fed up by 18 years yeah so it's not just play people also liked got it at least the first 25 years got it but by the end of the century after a glorious revolution something will change okay the easiest way to grasp a particular tone of restoration period is to think of it as a reaction against the puritanism of cromwell and period of commonwealth the desolous court of charles the second is well known in the history and legend and he himself participated in that right so in a way he wasn't much interested in this whole tussle between parliamentarians and king or who is more powerful king or parliament or which church should be followed right since the majority of them were anglican church he simply passed the clarendon code and you know he enjoyed his life he did not want to get into any tussle okay any issues you know with what you know like his father charles one right he knew what happened to him so he wanted to avoid that right congreve was not born until 10 years after the restoration right so william congreve was born in 1670 right the way of the world was the first presented when he was 30 years old right so when of the when of when this play was published it was published and presented in 1700 okay don't forget the date okay 1700 by the time some of the most obvious and most notorious features of the period no longer existed or existed only in much weaker forms yeah right so in a way when the way of the world is a typical road restoration comedy yeah but many of those features you know which he described in the drama was not there in the society because what is the time now it is 1700 restoration when it happened 1660 So 1660 to late 1685, it was it had all the characteristics as long as Charles I was alive. After Charles I, three years of James II, yeah. And when James, after the death of James, that is you know disposition of James II, glorious revolution happened, right? We all know 1688, glorious revolution, and the kingdom was given to whom? It was given to Mary and you know Orange, William of Orange. and both of them they did not have any interest in theater okay right so they did not encourage or patronage any theater activity right and there were many reasons why way of the world when it was published and performed in 1700 failed yeah it is a very good drama actually okay at the hindsight we look at it is the best drama of the period the best drama we can see in those 40 years even better than many of those plays of even dryden okay but it never succeeded because there were so many reasons some of the reasons i already told you <coughs> some other reasons were there in the play itself we'll see to that later 
Because of the striking characterization and brilliant dialogue, the way of the world is generally considered as the best romantic com restoration comedy. Nevertheless, it was not successful when it was first presented in 1700. Although the English audience, unlike the French, were accustomed to plots and subplot to great deal and action in the play, they were confused by the amount of activity cramped in a single day, right? When the play deals with that and the issues of the time. And play also is very complicated, okay? If you miss some, imagine five minutes, 10 minutes, you would lose the plot, okay? We'll see to that later. The way of the world had only single action to which everything was related, but it concluded with a scheme, counterplot to frustrate the scheme and then move to counterplot, right? There were so many episode events and reversal and discovery that most of them huddled in the last act and they demanded too much of the attention of the audience. If difficulty was performed, it was, you know, only the actors, those who were responsible, they could have done that. But all these were the reasons why drama failed, right? And there were political reasons also, remember, you know, remember the reason of, you know, William of Orange and their support, okay? Some of the well-known famous restoration comedies are Melores play The Misanthrope or A Cankerous Lover. Please try to memorize subtitles. Okay, I have given you the complete list, but the most famous one out of that, at least some eight to nine are there. Try to memorize them. Okay, William Wycherley's play, Country Wife and the Plain Dealer. George Etherard's play, The More Man of More or Sir Flopping Flutter. Sir Flopping Flutter. Many times they ask this sub subtitle question. Okay, they can ask you, Sir Flopping Flutter is the subtitle of which play? Right? The Cankerous Lover is the subtitle of which play and who wrote it? Something like that or the date. Right? George Fogwa's play, The rec uh, Recruiting Officer. John Warnberg's play, The Provoked Wife. Right? 1697. Typical example of restoration comedies. William Congreves, right? When he wrote his first five important plays, The Old Bachelor, 1693. The Double Dealer, 1694. Love for Love, 1695. The Morning Bride, 1697. And his most famous play, The Way of the World in 1700. Okay. So William Congre, who arrived late from 1693 to 1700. Yeah. Okay. So that was Restoration. At the time, there was another writer, in fact, the first female writer also we can see, right, who earned money through, you know, her living through writing play, Alfra Penn, right? She was the first English woman to earn her living by writing. She was born in 1640 and brought up in the West Indies, but returned to England aged 18. In one of our shorts video, I have given you something about Alfra Ben and her novel, Orunoku. Please go and watch it. Yeah, I have repeated more than 200 times in the last four months. Please go and watch all those shorts, okay? Particularly around 65, 70 shorts are there. Those who have joined recently, please go and watch. Click again and again. Whenever you travel, do something. Use watch our YouTube channel. There are famous quotations, around 500 quotation, four videos, terminologies videos, subtitle videos, some longer videos, four to five minutes short videos on short, short topics, right? And uh, these lot of, you know, Booker Prize, post-colonial, Australian, Indian, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, many works, around 55 to 60 works are there just by watching them, you know, you know in 60 seconds only. Right? In YouTube, when you click it, it will continuously play. People know that people are so lazy. They don't even want to click. That's why they created like that. It will continuously run. I hope all of you must have tried. Know how the shots run. Right? Like the like the reels in Instagram. Okay? So, something about, uh, you know, Alfred Ben. Right? This was her painting. She married a Dutch merchant, but after his death, she found herself in a debtor's prison and was forced to took for look for means to support herself. Her first employment was a spy, but she was not paid and turned to writing. Her first play was Forced Marriage, was a tragic comedy and was produced at one of London's two main theatres, Lincoln Innsfield Theatre 
about which I showed you the painting, right? Painting of Lincoln Innsfield. Please remember the name. With the famous uh, Thomas Betterton playing the lead. She also wrote the novel set in West Indies called Orunoku, which was made into a play shortly after Ben's death in 1689. Something more about Orunoku is in there in the short video, right? Please uh, subscribe and go and, you know, watch it, right? Okay, so that's about uh, a minor writer doing restoration. So it's a miscellaneous information. They are not going to ask you very detailed question, right? That's about restoration comedy. In this backdrop, we have to look at the individual plays, okay? We'll have a short gist of some other dramatists and their play, the names which I mentioned, okay, about them. And uh, all the plays, particularly detailed study of, rest, uh, you know, way of the world we'll do tomorrow and a short gist of other plays of William Congreve, okay? Okay, then, so thank you with this.